All right. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Hilary Taverna. I'm uh, one of the co-directors of programming at BPMA. I'm joined by um, Prachi and David Tabiri, who are on the call as well, who are my fellow um, leaders as well of the events or programming team here at BPMA. Um, we also have Dave Robbins on the, the call, who's president of BPMA as well. So we've got lots of folks um, from the team who are on, we're excited to bring um, a panel to you today on product strategy. So thanks for joining. I know some of you might be in the Boston area and have uh, joined us through those connections, but if you're joining us from another location as well, it's great to have you. We hope you join us for future events and stay involved. So um, people will continue to kind of trickle in throughout the session. Um, so we'll let them in, but um, we're gonna get started. So welcome. We have a, a packed agenda today to bring you lots of um, questions and perspectives on product strategy. So um, I'll take a, a dive into what we'll look to cover today. If you've never joined us for one of our sessions before, um, welcome. And the way that today's session will work is that sort of a panel style, um, you know, round robin presentation on some questions that we've curated around this topic of product strategy. Um, the timeline for the session, just spend just a couple minutes introducing um, our speakers and telling you a little bit about BPMA in general. So you have some context. Um, and then we'll spend a good chunk of the session around 30 minutes or so um, cycling through some questions that we've queued up around product strategy. And we'll have our panelists, our three speakers today, speak to those questions and give you their perspectives. Um, we'll also ask that throughout the session, you share any questions that you might have on product strategy that haven't been covered yet. Um, so feel free to use the chat pretty liberally throughout the session and just drop your questions right there. Um, we'll make sure at the end, we'll set aside about 10 or 15 minutes or so to those audience questions in the event that we didn't cover any of them during the session. Um, and we, we definitely welcome those. So some quick guiding principles, again, if you haven't joined um, one of our events before, definitely encourage cameras on if you're comfortable. If you're, I know it's lunchtime around the, the East Coast of the US, so if you're eating lunch and you wanna stay off camera, totally fine, but um, definitely want this to feel like a networking space and a place where you can connect with other people in the field, in the area. And so, you know, it can be hard sometimes to do that without seeing you all. We definitely love um, seeing your faces when we um, are sort of in the, the present mode here, so. Um, happy to see you. Definitely encourage networking. So if you could, over the next few minutes as we kick it off, you want to drop a note of your name, your title, where you work, or where you're attending school, and where you're based, that would be great. Just love a chance to get to know folks who join us and what they're looking for and what industry they're in and all that. Um, feel free to share your LinkedIn uh, profile if you'd like as well. And if you're interested in making connections, um, ha we're happy to add you and um, and stay connected. And then again, ask questions in the chat as we go. So these sessions are, we wanna make sure that they're for you and they're um, answering the questions that, that you have. So while we've queued up questions that we anticipate the audience might have, we definitely wanna make sure that your, your questions and your perspectives are put out there as well. So quick, just a couple of notes on BPMA. So we're Boston Product Management Association. We are a, a nonprofit organization that um, we dedicate a lot of time and resources um, and energy to career development in the product management and product marketing space. Um, originally mostly around the Boston area, but naturally like a lot of organizations that are similar to us, we've kind of grown our audience since moving mostly virtual. Um, I'll mention a bit later, we are looking to start having a couple of in-person events again to get people together in person who are interested. Um, but one benefit of being online is we're able to kind of expand our reach. So we offer events, um, content, and um, other uh, opportunities like a mentorship program and a job board online um, that you can check out at our website. Just Google BPMA and you'll find it. Um, we've got lots of sponsors and partners who help us to make events like these possible. So definitely check these out as well. They're typically either in the product space as well or local, you know, Boston-based organizations that um, you can really find, find benefit in. So please check these out. I'll pass along this um, presentation in a follow-up email to this session too, so you can have access to this presentation. And then these are just some snapshots of the things we offered that I mentioned. So we've got blo a blog where our content team um, writes lots of articles around the product um, industry and, you know, 
skills and development and career growth and all that. So check that out. We've got a mentorship program if you're interested in either breaking into the product space or you're already in the product space and would like to um, kind of grow your career, we can pair you up with a mentor. So just um, you know, check that out on our website as well. We've got a public facing job board where we have product related jobs posted um, pretty often. Lots of events like these. We wanna make sure the topics are relevant and interesting for um, you know, for all of you, for, for folks who want to attend. So at the end of the session, we have a survey that we'd love for you to fill out. One of the questions asks about um, your interest in future events, what topics would be most relevant to you and mo most helpful in your career growth. And then we've also got a Slack community. So if you join um, the BPMA program as a member, we have a Slack community with lots of channels dedicated to different topics around the space where you can network and, and kind of learn more. So the last thing I want to note is just what our upcoming events are. So in addition to the one today, we've got um, one next Friday, the 24th, around building an interview roadmap for exceptional interview outcomes. So if you're in that space right now and thinking about interviewing and um, want to learn a bit more, feel free to join that. All of these events are free. And then an event on July 15th, be an inclusion champion um, around DEI. And then Coming soon, as I mentioned, we have a couple of in-person events we're working on scheduling. So um, there'll definitely be kind of a, a max attendance uh, number of seats we can fill, but um, we're excited to kind of get to meet up with some folks in, in person and, and start networking again. So keep an eye out for those. Those should be posted in the next few weeks. All right, thanks for bearing with me through that. Um, hope you, you know, you find some value in what we offer and, and check out our website or feel free to reach out to me or Prachi directly if you have questions about events or suggestions. So gonna kick it off to today's speakers. Thank, thank you so much, the three of you for joining us today to, to share your perspective on product strategy. So we've got lots of questions that we'll queue up, but before we do that, I'd love for um, the panelists to introduce themselves, just a little bit about um, who you are, where you, you're based, um, what you do, and, and any um, relevant experience you want to share with us would be great. Um, so Morgan, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll kick it off and start with you. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Morgan Beshley. I'm Chief Product Officer at Curator. I live here in Boston. Um, for those local, I live in East Arlington, right on the Cambridge line near Alewife. Um, with my uh, three kiddos and a husband who's also in healthcare. Um, I have spent my career at uh, health IT, digital health, early stage, growth stage startups. Um, a couple of opportunities in the Boston area, but honestly, I've spent most of my time living here and flying on airplanes to other cities uh, uh, where the companies I work for uh, reside, although it's becoming less and less of a thing in our new world. Um, have uh, primarily focused on kind of the narrow space of improving quality while reducing costs for patients and other stakeholders in healthcare. Uh, so excited to be here and talk more about product strategy. Great, thanks so much, Morgan. Um, okay, Sean, I'm gonna kick it off to you next. If you don't mind just introducing yourself. Not a problem, thank you very much. Uh, Sean Robinson, uh, Vice President of Product Management at Monster. And see, I've been there about four years. I am also in the Boston area out of Andover and have worked for large companies, small companies, medium-sized companies. Um, so I've seen a lot of different sized companies. Um, I, early in my career, I was a software engineer and uh, went to business school and went to the dark side and came, and came to product management. Um, been, been in product management ever since. So having a lot of fun with that. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. And then last but not least, Aparo, if you want to just kick it off as well. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, again, thanks for having me here today. Uh, my name is Aparo Kari. Um, I've been living and working in the greater Boston area for more than 20 years now. Um, I live in a town called Westford, uh, which is um, about you know, 30, 35 miles north of Boston. Um, I live here with my wife and uh, two children. Um, on a professional front, um, I'm mainly focused on product management for uh, B2B enterprise software companies uh, targeting the sales and marketing personas. I think about, you know, um, sales, uh, CRM systems, marketing automation, business intelligence, that space. Um, another core area of focus for me is enterprise data operations and governance and management. 
so in those specific areas, I've worked for different size companies, uh, small, medium, large. Um, I've also run my own startup for about four years. Um, I co-founded and uh, ran the company for four years before I transitioned out. Uh, so that's that's really my um, professional background. Right now, I'm working as a senior director of product management at Zoom Info, um, and I also uh, mentor uh, uh, at BPMA. And I'm happy to help anyone looking to build a career in product management. Um, and also, we are always looking for uh, product management and talent at Zoom Info. So yeah, if you if anybody's looking for new opportunities, just uh, link up with me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thanks so much. And just wanted to, before it gets lost, I know Morgan dropped a similar comment in the chat about hiring um, and having opening position, open positions. So obviously, you know, panelists and folks on the call, um, feel free to share that information as well too. I know lots of people are interested in, in open opportunities. So, all right. So we can get started. So as I mentioned, you know, we have some, we have kind of three topics related to product strategy that we'll cycle through that we have some very specific questions for our panelists on. Um, but if you don't see a question here, or even if you're just curious, or you're not quite sure if it's 100% relevant to the topic, um, please drop your questions in the chat and we will keep an eye on them. And towards the end of the session, we'll leave some time to, to ask those as well. Um, all right, so we're gonna start with this first um, page here, which is really questions related to just understanding product strategy as a whole. So whether you're you're new to product management or not yet in the field, or even if you're deeply entrenched in the field, <coughs> you just kind of want a deeper understanding or a refresher here. Let's start with just the basics of let's try to demystify product strategy for our attendees. So what is it and what is it not from your perspective? Um, so I'm gonna start with Sean, if that's okay. Sure. So product strategy is, um, I think a good way to think of it, um, it really is an opportunity to define what it is you're striving for, right? So in the way I think of product strategy, it falls into three vectors. So I'm going to get a little mathy if you don't mind. Um, so one vector is looks, looks at the, the market, you know, are you meeting the needs of the market you're trying to address? Second vector, and these are no particular order. Second vector is looking at the for, the, for for those who have products or customers, existing customers, looking at what is it, what are the needs of your current set of customers, right? So the market you're going after is not necessarily the same thing as, the, as servicing the, the, your current set of customers. And then the third vector is really looking at what aligns with the organizational strategy that you're working for. Said differently, what does your company want to be when it grows up? Right, and to make sure that what you're trying to think of and innovate on is really aligned with what the company that you're working for wants to be. So I'll, I'll start there and I'm sure there'll be opportunities to jump in with more. Great, thanks, Sean. And then Morgan, what about you? Any perspective you can share there? Yeah, I agree with everything Sean just said. Um, you know, this is, this first bullet, this word demystify is something I actually feel really passionate about um, in product leadership. I found in my own career that sometimes scary words like strategy um, can feel a little bit like this um, kind of like ceiling of of how do you sort of break through into the next role when you're thinking maybe you're a PM and you're thinking about being a senior PM or you're kind of on the cusp of your first director of product role. Um, I think sometimes, unfortunately, people in the industry uh, maintain some job security by keeping it mystified. Um, and that can be tough, especially for uh, you know, maybe women or underrepresented groups that are less likely to be in those roles. So um, what I've found in learning through doing more exposure and reading um, and making some mistakes is that it's a lot simpler than it sounds um, and that you should, uh, a really strong product strategy is actually a simple one. Um, the way that I think about strategy is really just the path that you plan to get to a, a destination. There can be more than one. Sometimes there can be multiple good ones. Um, the best product strategies I've seen are ones that are focused on outcomes and goals. So I, when I'm thinking about a strategy, I think about how do I answer the question, how will I know that I've made progress towards the final destination? So how do I know that I'm 25% of the way there? How do I know that I'm 75% of the, the way there? What metrics? will tell me um, that we're headed in the right direction. 
And remember, it's not, we'll talk about this a little bit more in some of these other questions, but it's not necessarily how you're going to get there, right? It's not, um, you're not yet talking about like the what or the how. Um, it's more about what are those outcomes? What are those goals that are going to achieve those things that Sean's talking about, right? For that market, for that customer need. Um, how would you articulate some of those metrics is where I begin. Great. Thanks, Morgan and Sean. It's helpful. Um, the next two questions are really around um, trying to differentiate between product strategy and some other terms or concepts that I think um, we often confuse strategy with or conflate it with. Um, and the first one is around product vision. So if you could speak a little bit to you know, the difference between product strategy and a product vision, um, that would be helpful. And I'll start with you again, Sean. Sure, so vision is, is really, at least the way I think of it, it's the goal. What is the goal, right? You know, um, ultimately in terms of, you know, what problems are you trying to solve? And in a very, very broad sense, right? Strategy looks at the, maybe the way to describe it is the direction you're trying to take to realize that vision. That's the way I'd make that distinction. Got it. And then what about you, Morgan? Yeah, agree. I would, I think of vision as kind of your North Star, your inspiration. Um, the, the analogy I always use with my teams is if you're thinking about kind of where you want to go on vacation, uh, your vision might be, I want it to be sunny. I want some beach time, but I want some local food options. Um, you know, maybe I also want to be able to do a little hiking to kind of stay active. Um, but that's just kind of what you want it to feel like, right? Sort of um, your kind of North star, but you're not necessarily limiting yourself to the actual, you know, maybe Costa Rica and Puerto Rico meet that need. So when you get into your strategy, that's when you're starting to talk about, okay, what are my constraints? What are my budget? What's my budget? Uh, maybe I'm bringing a couple of kiddos and I don't really want to be on a plane for more than six hours. Um, maybe I don't want to have to speak a different language than my primary language. So you start to kind of get into some of those constraints. Um, and now you're starting to kind of hone in on, I still know what my vision is. I still know kind of what I want the vacation to feel like, but here's a couple different strategies or plans that might lead me to the vacation of my dreams. Um, the other component here that kind of gets to what Sean said at the beginning about where your company is and what it wants to be when it grows up is there's also this kind of, we just, I'm just going to keep rolling with this vacation thing. Um, <laughs> you know, if you think about kind of the the time frame you're thinking about, um, or maybe the company's exit strategy. If you're talking about a vacation you're planning 10 years from now, maybe I can put the effort in to plan to sail around the world with my family or take a whole year off in Europe. But if you're talking about, you know, where are we going to take the kids on February break? Um, you probably are going to have a different strategy to get there. There's not going to, maybe the, the, the round the world sailing trip just isn't possible in that time frame and that type of you know, and time frame doesn't have to be the only lever here. It could also just be like, I want to go, I'm going to take this company IPO and it, I have 10 years to do it, or I'm going to get acquired in the next six months. So um, those are just some of the things that I think about. Great. Yeah, really, really interesting and helpful analogy. <laughs> I like it. Um, all right. And then similar question, what's the difference between a product strategy and a product roadmap? So I'm going to kick it off to Aparo first for this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to straddle a little bit on like some of the topics that were discussed in the last five minutes. I think this whole separation between like product vision, product strategy, product roadmap. I mean, as much as us product management professionals want to draw that clear delineation or line between those things, I think you know it's 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 important for us to acknowledge that in the real world, in a lot of situations, there is these things are really blurred, right? So that's why I think we're even talking about like you know clearly articulating and understanding what the difference is, right? Um, what, you know, when I, when I try to compare product strategy with product roadmap, I think this is probably the easiest separation we can do, right? It's, it's even more bloodier when you do vision and strategy, like, you know, Sean and, and Morgan mentioned, but strategy and roadmap are very, very, I think, clearly different, right? And the strategy is more about, uh, why are we building this given product? Um, and I think one point that, uh, hasn't been touched on yet is, your alignment with business strategy. Like how does this align with your overall business goals? Why are we even investing in this product, right? I think it has to trickle down. Your product strategy has to trickle down from your business strategy, right? Uh, your CEO, your you know business leaders are um, 
paving a path or creating a vision for the business itself and like to to deliver on that vision of course we have to sell something and most of the times you know product companies sell products and so what what is the why so so why are we building this product or uh, why are we even thinking about this product what pain points does it solve um and how are we going to make money and i'm assuming you know there are other ways of monetizing products like uh, active users and things like that but let's just keep it as revenue to keep it simple um, how are we going to make money and is it actually are we going to really make money solving this problem i think these all things formulate what is called as the product strategy right like you know why is the big the if there's one word that describes product strategy it's why i mean everybody on this call probably know it by now uh, and um but also it kind of kind of bleeds a little bit into the what as well like i think but the what is at more around the 30000 feet level like you know this is the problem we are trying to solve this is the solution this is how it is aligned with the business goals and this is how we're planning to make money right i think that's the product strategy umbrella product roadmap on the other hand um is about execution i think it's about getting to from that 30000 feet level of what to let's say more detailed um you know a grid that shows features functionality um, expected timelines, um, estimations, level of complexity, and all of that stuff. It's more around taking the uh, the vision strategy and creating um, uh, a, a reasonable plan uh, to showcase how we can deliver on that strategy, right? I think that the roadmap, again, the, the two keywords are, the main keyword is what, and then a little bit of bleeding into how, right? If you look at it like, why we're building is mainly product strategy bleeds a little bit into the what which is mainly about the roadmap and the how which leads into the implementation part which is like you know that's how i see uh, the clear delineation between uh, product roadmap and strategy so uh, another thing to keep in mind is i think these things go hand in hand as the product roadmap changes um, it's important to make sure that it doesn't conflict with the strategy right um, and that cannot be taken lightly right like for example I've had scenarios where there's a product um, being sold primarily into the US market. There was one company, large multinational, which is spending millions of dollars with us, comes and says, I want this product in French. So somebody decides to just add a French language pack to that product and it is shipped. And now, you know, we are scrambling, you know, we have to find uh, an ecosystem to support it, right? So there was never a product strategy to enter like, you know, non-English markets but we kind of like delivered something on the roadmap which serves non-English markets. So that's that's something that should be very carefully uh, uh, taken uh, into consideration and vice versa is also true. I think as product strategy evolves, the roadmaps also will have to adopt to it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, the next two questions are really around um, you know, how, how product strategies come into existence. So Sean, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Um, who creates or writes the product strategy? Who is responsible for that within an organization? So I'm gonna be a little liberal uh, <laughs> on this one, right? So so I, I the way, and, and here's how. So I think there's an opportunity for everyone to get involved. That said, uh, and I think what you're really asking is who, who ultimately owns the, the final product, if you will. No pun intended uh, um, for the product strategy. I think the product strategy would be owned by um, like a chief product officer or someone you know on, the, on that level, or someone who's who's been delegated to kind of own strategy for your organization. That's the that's one level. But the other piece of it is, I like to think that person doesn't do it by themselves, and you really want to get input throughout the organization with those you know product managers and you know various lines. Uh, of management throughout who own various pieces of it to, to hear from them and their experiences of looking at um, solving the set of problems that they're focusing on and seeing you know, where the commonalities are and, and really how do we align. Um, that's, I think it's a good sanity check to make sure that you're inclusive not only of kind of you know, your observations and the, and the research you're doing, but also grounding it to you know, what's, what's happening on the ground, you know, especially if you, have a solution that you're you're making better uh, as opposed to building for the very first time. Got it. And then Morgan, what about from your perspective? Agree with that. I, and just to add color to that, <clears throat> I would go so far as to say that, um, you know, in my role, 
today I feel accountable for our product strategy, but it's a very difficult to effectively implement a strategy if you don't have really strong buy-in from a CEO, from, you know, in, in our space at Curator, we're a tech enabled service. We're not software as a service. So we have a whole clinical arm that's actually, you know, they're like humans that are part of our product. Um, it's really difficult if you don't get their leadership really bought in, involved, contributing to that strategy to then just roll it out um, effectively. So that's something I've learned over the years. And there's there's interesting dynamics too, if, you know, being in the, in the startup space, I've worked for some founder-led startups um, where the company is kind of like their newborn child. And as a product leader, you're sometimes trying to like peel it away from their hands. So um, I think it also just depends on the makeup of your leadership team and where the strengths and weaknesses are. Sometimes you have a CEO who's really sales leaning. Sometimes you have a CEO that's literally invented, you know, carries a patent and invented the product. And that person's going to be really hard to separate from your product strategy. So you might have to really think about how do you kind of help that person think about where to take it to the next step, as opposed to kind of ripping it out of their hands. Um, so I think there's some art, part art, part science there, depending what organization you're in. Um, I've also seen some places, this kind of builds on something Aparo said, um, I've seen some struggles before as companies grow when your kind of business development strategy or your business strategy may be housed kind of separately from your product strategy. Uh, currently at Curator, we're a fairly small health IT company. So for us, it's fairly product led and it's all kind of centralized. Um, but I have seen that sometimes go sideways and that can lead to things like sales led roadmaps where your business development team is out there winning customers and then coming back to you and kind of dictating what you have to build in order to meet some now new contractual requirement. I'm guessing based on the audience on this call, it's not, that's not like the most fun dynamic to be in. Um, so that's again, gets back to my first point of buy-in, like being proactive with getting buy-in with your product strategy and other parts of the organization is really important to making it successful. Um, if it's just living in a PowerPoint deck somewhere and, and nobody's shining a light on it, it's not, it's not really that useful. Yeah, that's great. And something you mentioned, Morgan, that I think leads into our, our next question is, uh, so you mentioned, for example, there could be customer requests coming from the sales force, for example, that could be types of data or information that might lead someone to make decisions about product strategy or product roadmap. So I guess um, question for all three of you and, and anyone feel free to jump in, but um, how ideally is a product strategy created? What kinds of information or data should drive the creation of it? Is it, you know, customer feedback and requests from, from through sales or other customer um, facing teams? Is it, you know, certain research? What are your perspectives on that? Yeah, I, I can um, I can go for that. Um, I think you know one of the underlying questions that needs needs to be asked before we try to elaborate on some of these things is like you know uh, does a company really have a product strategy in place, right? Like I mean, uh, it goes back to the demystifying the product strategy question, right? And also ties back to what Morgan said. Uh, in smaller size companies, startups, a lot of times the strategy is in, in somebody's mind or it's in an investor deck, which is actually a pretty popular place to find product strategies in, in investor decks for smaller size companies. Um, but, but it also begs the you know, um, um, question again and again, like, you know, what is our product strategy, right? And there is a very common saying that if you don't have a product strategy, your existing customers will define your product strategy, right? You know, they'll they'll pull and push you into different directions to do things that they want. And especially if you land a big customer like a Dell or, you know, something like that, you know, they are dictating terms. They're they are crowding your roadmaps, right? So have, having said that, I think the, the first question is to ask like, okay, do we have a product strategy and, and where can we find it? So the, the some of the things that I see going into creating a, a product strategy roadmap are, dynamics around the, the the problem that we're solving and the, and the opportunity that exists, right? I'm, I'm using problem and opportunity as two. Sometimes they, it might not be a new problem, right? It may be existing problem being solved uh, in an inefficient way. You know, I think information from 
your you know customer feedback channels on slack or you know if you're using um direct customer feedback tools like aha you know bringing all of that into um uh, formulating a strategy what, what are the main things that we are lacking um in terms of competitive parity uh what what is already there um and and you know if you take that to a little bit more like who are our target buyer personas for this uh, why this solution is superior than what already exists out there. Um, and I think another important element that needs to go into product strategy is why are we the best company to solve this problem? I think this is sometimes uh, overlooked, and but this will also give uh, uh, more validation into when, when you have four or five problems you can solve, which problem should you invest in solving, right? Um, if you can meet the revenue goals of the company by taking by building, let's say, three different types of products, which one would you, which direction would you go, will be, I think, tied to where is your core expertise? What assets and what strengths do you have uh, to realize that product uh, vision? Um, I think that needs to go into an analysis of your strengths and why are you the best company to uh, solve that problem? Um, yeah, I, I think you know those are some of the things um, in terms of like how it is created. Um, I believe like the annual product planning in larger companies is the best place to get this started. And I've been at companies where we usually do it like that and then revisit it on a quarterly basis. Great, thanks Aparo. And then the last question on this um, side, I'm just gonna kick it over to you, Morgan, if that's okay. But um, is there one concept of a product strategy or are there different types out there? And if so, are there any kind of differences you could share between different types of strategies? Yeah. Oh gosh. This probably um, this probably this question is probably highly influenced by kind of the the narrow set of experiences I've had because um, you kind of don't know what you don't know. But I would say um, you know I've mostly been at VC backed early and growth stage companies. Um, so the the kind of different strategies I've seen are um, definitely kind of the fork of are you a company that is trying to go IPO versus a company that's trying to get acquired um, or merged? Um, are you a company that has direct competition or are you a company that's trying to create a new market? Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I've been at organizations that really need to first kind of put out that thought leadership and explain sort of a new concept or kind of win hearts and minds around a new problem that they're solving versus entering a space that maybe, um, you know, is already commoditized or, and you're just trying to differentiate against the competition. Um, those strategies are going to look really different. Um, and then there's this, this concept of like inorganic and organic growth. Um, I've been at some companies where the leadership team is interested in growing through M and A um versus companies that maybe are really kind of a little maybe more product focused i don't know if that's really the right language but um and trying to kind of grow more organically uh maybe for new market segments um so i think you know those are maybe different i don't know if i would call those different product strategies but those are kind of the different lenses that i've seen made them look really different the other thing i would say here is audience uh so the type of product strategy that i present to our board and potential investors during a financing round is really different uh, and probably shallower than the kind of strategy that we talk about internally and that we have the product managers understand deeply and swarming. Um, the metrics are kind of higher level and goal oriented and we get more into the weeds um, with the team internally. Got it. That's I, can, I can build on one thing I said. Um, Another dimension to that is also looking at what type of product are you you're talking about? Do you have a good or do you have a service, right? And so, because your behavior is going to be very different and thereby your strategies should be different, right? Um, or good, it's it's the that, you know, asset or it's, you know, whether it's small or large and, and, and touting its benefits and, you know, trying to get people to adopt it and so forth and so on. If it's a service, right, your behavior is going to be very different, right? And so, you know, the, probably the best example is the SaaS model, I think. Most folks are probably familiar with that, right? That's very much a service. And how you behave around that can be very, very different than, you know, selling a, a pet rock <laughs> um, and, and kind of going there. So I just wanted to add that as another dimension. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. 
And Sean, I'm trying to take the next one over too. So we're going to switch gears a bit and understanding a little bit of the, the basics of product strategy now, shift our focus into strengthening or improving product strategy once one does exist. So from your perspective, Sean, what makes a, a strong product strategy at an organization? What are kind of the characteristics that um, you know show that a lot of thought has gone, gone into this? Well, I think, great question. Uh, one is really, does the, does the product strategy align with your strengths, right? What, you know, because part of what you have to look at too is, is your ability to execute. You know, if, you, if you're trying to, I'll go back to my, my example for a moment. If you're, if you're trying to sell, um, try to be the best pet rock, you know, company ever, right? But, you know, you are in a, a, a SaaS business, right? I'll go back to that example. Right? Very, very, very different, right? And so if you're trying to do that huge pivot, you know, what, what's the road to get there? What does that look like, right? And so the strategy to move from or, or, or add to if you're trying to bulk up your, your portfolio um, and, and, and start servicing the market of pet rock lovers um, is going to be very different. So your ability to execute again uh, is going to be very, very important and tied to who you are today as an organization and what are the, again, what's your ability to execute on that? Um, so alignment and going back to my, my mathy um, point before in terms of th the, the three vectors, right? So look, so just to recap, so looking at the market you're trying to get, looking at the customer you're servicing, and then looking looking at the alignment with your company, is the product strategy aligned with the company that you're you're working with? And so so all three of those need to be satisfied. And if, if one of those are out of balance, then that's probably going to then it probably it will impact the the strength or weakness of your product strategy. Great. Thanks, Sean. And then Morgan, how about from your perspective? Um, yeah, so the other thing I might add here too is it's just as much about deciding what you're not doing as what you are doing. Um, so a couple examples I'll give there is um, at a previous healthcare company I was at, um, it had been kind of put together through a, a couple different M&A activities over the course of many years. Um, and we had, so, so the products, although maybe there was initial kind of hope at some point to um, do some cross-selling or some integration, in reality, they were really almost like three different tools, tech stacks, almost many companies. Um, and so each really had their own product strategy attached to them, some of which were just decide making a intentional decision to put them into some kind of maintenance mode. Um, so the kind of factors that went into that decision were, you know, in one case, we had a quality product that the government was showing signs with, that they were starting to retire some of those quality measures and pull them directly from EMRs over time. So any kind of investment we could make, you know, we'd only have returned maybe for a couple more years before the really use case existed anymore in the market. Um, that was one. Another was a product that had done really well and kind of seen its heyday as like the first in its um, in its class of the safety risk management tool. But over time, some more kind of modern up and coming companies came in, created a competitive product, beat us out on price, took a lot of market share. Um, and the customers had there was a lot, they, because the product was very sticky. So hospitals didn't really want to switch. Um, so the switch, the switching cost was really high. If you think about like training thousands and thousands of nurses on a workflow tool. So in that case, the strategy was really, if you were going to get more market share, you really had to think about buying up the little players in competition and actually growing in organically that way, um, which frankly was something the company I was working for didn't do fast enough. Um, the, the big competitor kind of beat us out on those deals too. So just want to give a couple other flavors that aren't necessarily kind of feature and function plays. It could be about, you know, you're at a pivot company and you've got some legacy baggage and you might still be hearing a lot from those customers that there's a lot of enhancements they want, but if there's really not growth potential in either increasing your customer value or increasing your customer base, it really may be time to put that in maintenance mode and put all of your eggs in the basket that can grow. Great, thanks, Morgan. Um, Apar, I'm gonna get the next one over to you. Um, and, you know, Morgan and Sean, you're kind of alluding to some examples, but um, 
So the question here is, what are examples of strong product strategies you've seen at organizations we might know? So whether they're product strategies that yep. you've kind of seen out there and admired, or you've had experience with um, seeing it, it strong in action. Sure. I, I, I won't go into iPhone as an example, because I think that's the greatest of all time <laughs> during our lifetimes here. So I won't use that. Everybody knows that. Now, we can use a couple of other examples. Let's say, for example, in social networking. Social networking has been, and by the way, I'll use some consumer examples, even though uh, uh, most of my business is on the B2B side. So social networking, you know, Facebook came, you know, it solved it, and, you know, it's the, the social network for a long time. But when you look at a player like Nextdoor, right, you know, their strategy was kind of niche focus, right? They've created a, a social network for community building within neighborhoods, right? Um, I think, you know, it's a fantastic strategy in terms of it is a dominant, like like really dominant player in that market, which a lot of the functionality that Nextdoor op offers can be done through Facebook, but it's not purpose built for it, right? But Nextdoor went ahead and adopted, like, you know, embraced this niche focusing, you know, neighborhoods need a very dedicated social network like platform where they can uh, share ideas and thoughts and different activities surrounding their neighborhood. Uh, and that became a success because of that niche focus, as well as they were able to monetize the platform more for it, the, the main monetization aspect here is advertising, right? Imagine, you know, the amount of focused advertising that can be done on next door for, you know, local services and vendors and things like that, right? And there's much more uh, relevant demographic information that's readily available to serve up specialty ads. So they really succeeded with that. And then if you look at another popular one is um, YouTube has been around like this is the dominant video platform and content like, you know, sharing um, um, a platform. Now, TikTok came out of nowhere, really, and then just took the whole content video sharing business, uh, area uh, by surprise. Right. And if you look at TikTok numbers now. YouTube is actually struggling to justify that, hey, we have as much traffic as TikTok. How did TikTok do it? I think their strategy was user experience um, based product strategy. Before, uh, even now in YouTube, it takes hours for you to upload um, a piece of content, a video, and then publish it, right? Whereas in TikTok, you can actually produce and publish your content on your smartphone in less than a few minutes. You can actually upload hundreds of videos in a month um, so they've changed the scale of video sharing and, and um, publishing uh, business through TikTok. And they've enabled tens of thousands, if not millions of creators across the world. Um, and again, like how did this help with their business? They can serve up more ads. The content is not like two hours or 20 minutes. It's two minutes or less. So more ads are served. Uh, you know, more content is produced. I think they nailed that strategy with the, the video content. There's another one I want, I want to talk about, which I was personally involved in at Zoom Info. Um, we, and the strategy really here is consolidation. So in the past, we used to deliver products that are focused at sales persona, marketing persona, and our data operations persona separately. Over the period of last four or five years, we've seen consolidation in that functional space more, moving more towards revenue operations, right? So where like there are chief revenue officers instead of chief marketing officer or chief sales officers, right? So we've consolidated our stack and then started doing one platform called revenue operating operating system rather than doing individual ones. So th those are some examples that come to my mind. Thanks, Aparo. Um, I'm gonna do one more question on this side because I think we kind of got at the last one a little bit in the, in some of the recent question responses, but this is one of my favorite ones. So what does it look like when an organization does not have a strong product strategy? So when a strong pro product strategy is not in place, what can kind of happen to teams or organizations? Or even worse, if there just simply is no product strategy um, at all. Uh, Morgan, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, I've seen a couple of examples. I'm sure we all have more examples in this bullet than the other one, um, unfortunately. Uh, I, a couple of themes come to mind here. One is um, if you don't have a strong product strategy, it you can get really reactive. Um, and it's a, I've found that that's especially a risk when you're in a fast-paced organization because it can sometimes maybe feel like there's never enough time to slow down and craft a really good strategy. Um, it's worth it. 
uh, and the, the more I've kind of progressed in my career, the more, the better I've gotten about creating that space. Um, and just to give a couple of examples of reactive, if you don't have a strategy that maybe you've gotten buy-in from your, even your customers and your prospective customers of saying, hey, we have an opinion on where we're going or to the board, we have an opinion on where we're going. And these are, this, these are the things we think are the most important. These are the goals we have and here's why, here's the metrics that, that'll tell us whether we're on our way and on the right path. Then when something new comes in, a new idea from a, a sales exec, a new idea from a, a big customer like Aparo was talking about, um, where you might have a customer that, you know, I've worked for companies twice now where a customer became a major investor of the company. So not only were they a customer that made up a big share of our revenue, they also then had a person sitting on our board. So their ability to pressure us into roadmap changes was high. Um, but if you have a strategy you can put in front of them and you actually have something to negotiate with them and talk about the trade they're asking you to make, especially if it's stark, you know, hey, I'm going to make this investment and it's not going to have as much short term gain as what you're talking about. But check out the long term game where we're headed um, to, to share the savings with you or whatever it is. Um, you at least have a fighting chance. Um, the other approach I've seen that doesn't work very well is to, and this, this I've seen generally happen in organizations that take on a lot of funding really fast and just hire tons of people and have this kind of attitude like, you know, if I just take a shotgun approach and throw a whole bunch of smart people um, on the bus, like innovation will occur. Um, and it does, but it's really painful. Um, it's hard to it's hard to do it in a focused way, and you kind of you end up losing. I've seen at least you end up some, losing some team morale because you might actually build multiple solutions to the same problem, and then you have someone in leadership telling an entire team that oh, it's really nice you you created that module, but actually I changed my mind because this other team was doing something really similar, and we're actually going to ship that. I've seen exam real examples of that um, in companies that were growing really fast, and and there was in my, in my opinion, uh, too much funding too soon. Got it. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us to the last set of topics. Just a couple last questions here. Um, so the qu first question here is, so starting to think about um, folks on the call who may be, again, people looking to break into product management for the first time, or who may be new in their career, may start to become more well-established in their career, or might even be higher up in kind of senior leadership. So no matter what, what um, level you may be in within a product org um, or outside of one, how does or should my team's product strategy drive what I actually do? So how should I be thinking about product strategy on a regular basis in the work that I do? Um, Sean, I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind on this one. Sure, so the way I, I like to approach this is I, I encourage everyone to think big, really, really big. Um, I, I, it's been my experience that, you know, folks within organizations in, in general, and not, not picking on any particular part of the organization, don't think big enough. And, and, and the reason I go there, it's because you, if you don't think big enough, then you can get a little insular in the thinking in terms of how you approach your strategy and you know, and ultimately, you know, determine like how you're going to execute on that vision. Um, and if you're thinking big, then you can start laying out it's like, okay, here's your strategy, and even start start adding layers based on. And I think Morgan touched on this point before in terms of where, where you are in the kind of maturity curve. I can call it that, and and really apply the right strategy based upon where, where you are. But if you're thinking big enough, you can actually layer it out and say, okay, here's where you go. And then as more data comes in, you pivot and, and have, and really geek out and stuff as you can hear me, hear my, my voice start thinking up here. Um, but that, that it's really, it's really important to think big. I, I can't stress that enough um, because it, because it, that, if you get the, if you get the picture right and you're thinking big enough, then your strategy should morph appropriately based upon kind of where you are. Great. And then a sort of similar question, um, how can I contribute to my team's product strategy? 
at any stage in my career. Um, Aparo, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll continue uh, what Sean was saying. And, and to make it even more specific, I think um, it's important for all of us, doesn't matter whether we're in charge of actually building the strategy or one that have to follow it. I think we should ask this question of like, what is our product strategy? A lot of times, I think, you know, more than 50% of the times, um, you'll get a very vague answer for that. I think in terms of contributing and helping your company have, uh, or your team have a strategy, asking that question is the most important thing we all can do. Um, and I think that will put a few people in, in uncomfortable positions, but that's okay. I think it's a very well-intended question. Uh, it's a very fair question. If you're being asked to build the roadmap, you could definitely ask like, okay, well, well, you know, can I look at a product strategy in a deck or a document somewhere, right? So I think that's the first thing, right? And then also, you know, keep an eye on uh, the, the competitive landscape, what's happening in the market trends, technology trends. And when you find something, I'd say like, you know, share that with your, you know, broader product team. Don't just share the link, share your analysis, at least a couple of bullet points on, okay, these two companies are merging. So what does that mean to our product strategy, right? Uh, so I try to apply that lens. I think anybody at any product management level can do that. Um, and that will kind of like start exercising your product strategy muscle. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, Sean and Morgan both mentioned it. Um, as in, as and when we do our day-to-day -day product management activities, we should always, there should be an undercurrent like, okay, does this align with the bigger picture, you know? Uh, is there any conflict with what the overall product vision and strategy is? I think if you do these things, um, automatically you'll be contributing to it, and doesn't matter where you are in the in your in your uh, product management uh, professional journey. Um, but you know whether you're just starting or whether you're already in charge of strategy, I think it'll help across the board. That's great. Thank you. Um, just looking at time, and then we have a couple minutes left. There were a couple of audience questions. I'm going to pull from one of them. Um, so for this last question on the deck, uh, what I'll say is, um, Morgan, Sean, and Aparo, if you don't mind, I'll take it offline and just get your quick thoughts over email. If you have any suggestions around resources to check out, I can create a, a list and share it in the email that I send out to all the attendees. Um, so we can kind of defer that one. Sure. But one question, one last question to throw your way, um, and feel free anyone to jump in um, from the panel that came from the audience from Kamal is, um, in the case of organizations having multiple products, how important is it to align the strategies? Um, if yes, it is important, how do we create a system to align it? Any specific examples would be very helpful. I don't know if anyone has experience with that or insight. Again, I, one, one immediate thought that came to my mind was um, some companies actually create business units that are you know, aligned with each product area. Then I think product manage, product strategy becomes very easy. But if the products are within the same business unit and then uh, there is a um, certain amount of uh, cannibalization or conflict, uh, that, would be, uh, that, that would be more difficult to handle in terms of product strategy. I think separation into business units, if they are like separate persona focused is, is, a, is one of the solution I've seen companies apply directly. I think it also depends a little. So I think the real answer is it depends on a lot of factors. Um, but one thing to think about is do the different products share the same market? You know, are, is it the same pros, like prospective customers that you're selling to with the same kind of buyer personas or maybe even buyer personas in the same market that are, you know, maybe slightly different departments, but at least in the same organization? Um, if that's true, then I think you probably need a really well-aligned product strategy because you're, if, if it's, um, or, or at least if you're going to create business units, you need to really think at a strategic level about how many resources should be applied to each. This is where I've seen um, resource allocation really work too. So one of the things I think about in my role is I'm actually without even maybe intending to making decisions about how much I'm investing in either certain problems or certain products in the company, just based on how many engineers and product managers are tending to it, right? Because it's kind of like a hospital of however many beds are in it, it just magically fills up with patients. If you throw engineers and product managers at problems, they're going to fill up a roadmap, they're going to fill up sprints. So that's kind of just another way to, to think about it. But again, I think it really depends on 
are you solving in the same problem space or selling to the same people? And then I think it does need to be aligned. And one thing I would add too, and I, and I loved what Paul said earlier, which is, I think it's probably going force, you forced to have uncomfortable conversations because uh, inevitably those business units are not going to be talking the way they need to be in order to have that alignment. Um, and so there's going to be kind of a collective bumping of the head heads, plural, in terms of um, seeing what's not going to work. And then, you know, the organization is going to be forced to pivot and have that alignment um, and have those uncomfortable conversations and, and, you know, come out hopefully on the other end of it with, with a positive, well-aligned uh, product strategy across all the business, business units. Yeah. And, and uh, to add to that, Sean, a lot of times the people that exhibit more passion and it, it are, speak a lot and, you know, are willing to um, showcase that there is value that's going to come out of one product versus other. The ones that are more vocal will get, will win, will get the resources and will. So that's the, that can, that's the nature of the business, right? The business is willing to invest in people that are more confident about the end results, right? Uh, I think that's, that's really common. Well said. Thank you all so much. I know we're just about at time. So I just want to thank Morgan, Sean, and Aparo. Thank you so much for your time and for your insights towards these topics. It's been really helpful. Um, and insightful. So appreciate your perspective and you bringing your experiences um, to the table for those of us who are, again, are either interested in breaking into this field for the first time and curious about product strategy or people who are already in the field and looking to, um, to kind of improve our understanding. So thank you. Um, I did drop a link to the survey in the chat. So for everyone on the call, I will, I think I mentioned at the beginning, I'll follow up with an email with um, kind of a copy of the chat log in case you wanted to connect with one another and add people on LinkedIn. Um, some information on any unanswered questions that might have been thrown in there. And then a list of um, resources that I can hopefully gather from our panelists to recommend that you check out, as well as a link to the recording. So thank you all so much for joining today. We really, really appreciate your time. And we, like I said, check us out on, um, you know, on LinkedIn or on our website, and we hope to see you at future events. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Hillary. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys.